Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. What was that move? Were you cute? I don't that know. Was like, it was like it was like action. Go like, for Pete. You're yeah, on. Right, go, Pete. Right. Cam- go roll camera you're, two. That's what we roll the camera. That's, right. that's what we that's just right. did. It is uh, uh it, it is another fine day when we can podcast together. And today we are talking about overwhelming ADHD. Plus, we've got a little bit of a tag from last week's member show. We're gonna fill you in on surprise transitions. We talked about transitions last week. The the bonus section of last week's show, uh, what happens when transitions come around that you didn't expect? How do you deal with those? And our very fair guest is going to help us with that. And our guest, speaking of, it's Ian Wallert, a new uh, ADHD coach with uh, uh, with TCA. We're very excited to have Ian on the show. He's a real gem. Yes, we are. He's, he's a real. He's a He's, he's a, a shining star, a real, he real is. shining star. We like Ian a lot. Shiny ADHD shiny, star. Shiny, shiny ADHD star. I think I picked up maybe too mm-hmm. much from James Ochoa. Right. I have used shiny, I think, 50,000 times this week. So there we go. Oh, uh, but before right. we get started on this very shiny show, uh, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or Discord. Join our community, uh, our public community on Discord at TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord, and uh, you'll be taken over to the login page there. But if you're looking for a little more, become a patron at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Patreon is listener supported podcasting for a few bucks a month that you throw our way. We throw you lots of new stuff. You get access to special areas in our Discord community. You get special uh, sessions with me and with Nikki and with me and Nikki. Uh, and you get access to an incredible, incredible community of people living with ADHD and supporting one another. Uh, visit again, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. And with that, you know, I got to tell you about my favorite, favorite invisible tool in my tool chest, Nikki. Yes, you yeah, do. I do. It's Text Expander. That's my invisible tool in my tool chest. Text Expander. It's always there, running in the background, waiting for me. I just sit on my computer and I type a little snippet. My latest snippet is a uh, semicolon ADHDT. Do you know what that does? ADHDT. Mm-hmm. I have no yeah. idea. So here's where here's what I do. Uh, every week we submit our podcast to our transcriptionist and they send us back a text file and I take that text file and I have to put it on the website, right? Got to do this every right. week. So I take that text file and I hit command A on my Mac and I select all, command C to copy it. And then I go to the website, put my cursor where it needs to go and I type semicolon ADHDT and it puts in there because text expander is amazing. I type that little snippet and it puts the title. This is the episode transcript. This transcript is brought to you uh, by the support of the ADHD oh. community. And then it unloads my entire clipboard. The entire transcript just gets dropped in automatically. I just type those, those little keys and I get a bazillion characters of text, including my clipboard that has just been dumped into. That's how Text Expander works. You store copy in the Text Expander library, you type your snippet, and then when you and then it expands. And then you have text. It works for everything. It works for text. It works for Text Expander. Text Expander. That's it's why in it's the, it was that. written on the ta- <laughs> on the tin, y'all. It's that good. Uh, so we're talking a lot about overwhelm today and about overcoming the challenges of of living with ADHD and overwhelm. And I'm telling you, as a tech tool for overcoming overwhelm, that kind of thing where you can take and manipulate text the way you can with Text Expander is a key, key tool for me. I love it. I love it. I love it. I dream about. I have had text expander dreams. I'm not proud of it, <laughs> but it's happened. Uh, okay. So it, you should check it out again. Find it, store it, expand it, and share it if you're in a family or a uh, or, or a business, and you think, hey, you know what? We, we could reduce errors and be real consistent in what we do if we had our teams using text expander and and uh, copying, you know, uh, marketing copy or compliance copy, whatever you need to put in text expander, it will work. It is super super easy. It is available on 
Windows and Mac and Chrome and iPhone and iPad. And for listeners of the ADHD podcast, you can get 20% off your first year of service if you visit TakeControlADHD.com slash text expander. Now, that's on our website, TakeControlADHD.com slash text expander. And it's going to redirect you to our page over at Text Expander's website where that code will be uh, employed. So when you enter in your credentials to sign up, you will get that 20% off. The way we work is changing rapidly. Make work work the way your brain works by saying more in less time and with less effort using Text Expander. Our great thanks to the Text Expander team for sponsoring the ADHD podcast. Nikki, do we have news? No. We have no news? No, this is no, a news-free no, episode? No, it's a news-free episode. Oh Let's gosh. get to talking about overwhelm. He's, he's behind the he's behind the velvet curtain. Let's go, let, let me go. All there. right. Ian. Ian Wallert is uh he's here with us today. He's uh, first and foremost, and the most shiny thing about Ian is that he is a new TCA coach, and we're so excited to have him here and to introduce him to you all. Uh he, he is a globe-trotting ADHD coach. He he did his uh undergraduate at Oregon State University uh here in our fair state of Oregon, and then he went to Sydney. To get, and that's not like Sydney, Oregon, right? There's no Sydney, Oregon. It's a, it was it was Sydney, Australia. He got his master's degree, uh, and then just dove head first, headlong into ADHD. He got his coaching certificate from ADCA, and uh, is here with us, ready to go. Ian, welcome to the show. Finally. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really, really excited to be here. We're excited to have you. We are excited to have you. We're going to talk about ADHD uh, overwhelm today, but we're going to use the opportunity to lead in with a topic that came up in our after show, our members after show last week. Which, uh, you know, last week's show, if you heard it, was on uh, making transitions and how hard it is to do context shifts with ADHD. And after the show, we started talking about uh, uh, transitions that are surprises, right? Not just like, oh, I know I'm going to have to leave work at six o'clock. I, it, it's, oh my goodness, something horrific has happened or some surprise has happened is changing my day. Uh, Nikki, you want to set that up and, and how that hit us? Today? Yeah, yeah. So it was a conversation after the show. And uh, it, it was interesting because it never really came up in our conversation in the show about yeah. those those transitions that we're not expecting. We we talked about everything that we do expect. So it was an interesting uh, perspective and definitely something that that I felt was important that we followed up on. And uh, in Discord, uh, there were a couple of questions that came up. One was, does medication help with transitions? And it was interesting because I did a little research on this and they don't necessarily specifically say anything about transitions. Uh, when they talk about stimulants, what they say is that they are there to work Work by increasing dopamine levels in the brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter associated with motivation, pleasure, attention, and movement. For many people with ADHD, stimulant medications boost concentration and focus while reducing hyperactive and impulsive behaviors. But there's nothing necessarily about, oh, they'll make transitions easier, yeah. <laughs> right? They help us focus, which in in some way, that that's that hyper-focus that we were talking about and why it's so hard to, to pull away. So, you know, I don't know if medication really helps with transitions specifically. It's hard to answer one way or the other because everybody yeah. has a different uh, experience with medication. What I would say is I wouldn't rely on the medication to necessarily help with transitions, but look more towards the different, uh, you know, tools and strategies that we were talking about in the show to help rather than really thinking that the medication is going to do anything because we're not really sure. Well, I do think, you know, you list uh, all of the things that the medication, we know the medication helps with. And, and I, I feel like all of those things are the constituent elements that go into making a successful transition. So while we might not be making the case that a medication is specifically going to help you with context shift, if it's going to help you smooth out the transition because you are more motivated, you're not dealing with fragmented attention as much, you aren't dealing with like all of those things go into being able to make smooth transitions. So I'll speak just for me. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with anxiety medication. Like when when my mood uh, is uh, flattened uh, uh, just a little bit, 
uh, in and around, you know, anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. It makes it easier for me to cope with surprises and not be mm-hmm. completely, you know, sandbagged by them. So I don't know. Ian, what do you right. think? You, welcome to the show. Here's your first shot. Turn on <laughs> what in. do you think? <laughs> it's hard. I've had about a thousand thoughts between the time it started until now. Uh, yeah, transitions and medication. Uh, I, I think they, like you said, it is a really unique journey for each person and the way in which the medication impacts them uh, makes a big difference in the capacity to do things, right? So um, I feel that with some people, it does help them have less noise, less distractions in their brain so they can they can choose what they're doing instead of being kind of driven by their ADHD, being able to, to take a little bit of control and say, look, this is what I want to do. And then now I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to start doing something else. I feel like for some people, it really increases that capacity uh, Mm -hmm. for them to do that. But yeah, like, Mm -hmm. like Nikki said, I think there's a lot of other ways to, to work on that scope and that, that, that clarity um, that's necessary beyond the medication, right? Mm -hmm. You still need to know what you're doing. What's the first step um, and, and how much time you want to put into something. These are all thoughts that need to happen uh, beyond the medication. Right, right. Well, and then another uh, statement came that she said, I can roll with the unexpected transitions, but I have a hard time getting back to the original task, which completely makes sense because now you've been pulled away and, uh, you know, that that getting started executive function is there and uh, it's hard to get back. And, you know, just a couple of things I wanted to to address with that is to reduce some of the friction of coming back to the task is to write down, uh, you know, where have you left off? What do you need or where do you start again? If you can do it at that moment, that can be really helpful. Uh, But something else that I think is even more important is if something new comes up in your day and you're interrupted, adjust your expectations for the day. Maybe it's okay that you leave all of that other stuff and do it tomorrow. Uh, You know, I, I think that sometimes we get into the, to the, uh, mindset that, well, just because this new thing came in, we now have to do the new thing and we have to do everything else that was on our list too. And I would say lessen some of those, you know, adjust and be okay with that. I I just have to add here because that's such an astute point. And uh, it's absolutely something I feel like I I am addressing every day and not even really thinking about it because I feel like I sort of have to rewire myself a little bit that if I'm pulled away from a task, I have to consider the tech coming back to the task, a new task again. Like there's no coming back to Mm -hmm. anything anymore. I'm really I have to muster the same amount of motivation and the same amount of of energy and attention to start a thing, even if it's in progress, that thing. Right. Like as soon as I do that, I feel like I can like to your point adjust expectations around myself and what I'm able to accomplish because I know I have the ramp up period as if it's a brand new task, right? Like Mm -hmm. it may be softened Mm -hmm. a little bit, but it's softened so, so little that it it might as well be a brand new thing uh, for my attentional well. Yeah. Great, great point, Pete. And and it's, it is starting a new task, right? Because we are constantly, even, even doing a task, there's multiple tasks inside. And I think that's part of yeah. that, that ADHD. Training. We're doing a task like cleaning our room, right? When in fact, that's like a million things, yeah. right? This desk is clean and where that thing on that desk goes, right? These are all little tasks, mm-hmm. right? And the challenge is that we do group them. Oh, I'm going to clean my room in an hour. Well, actually doing the task, managing what I'm going to do with these papers is going to take yeah. an hour, right? Um, so the expectation is very clear. And, and I think, initially putting these out into different segments really helps that capacity to switch back and forth uh, versus focusing on the the big goal, you know, mm-hmm. the big well, challenge. Well, and to, the, mm-hmm. to that point, Ian, I think this is where risk comes in for me. Again, speaking just for myself, uh, you know, sing it, community, if you feel this way. I find when I'm in the middle, let's say I'm in a task, a, a task like cleaning my room that takes m- many steps. Um if another task comes on, or let's just say I've run out of time because I then have a meeting and I have to sit in that room in which I was cleaning and then help hold that meeting, the risk is that because I know how much energy it's going to take to start cleaning my room again, I won't stop cleaning my room to focus on the meeting. Mm. 
that I will attempt in all foolishness to multitask because that's what my brain tells me I have to do. Please, God, please, Pete, don't stop doing this last thing because you're not finished with it. You're going to be a mess. You're never going to come back to it. It'll be half done for the rest of your life. And so you end up trying to multitask through it while you're in this meeting and you end up doing, as we know with multitasking, all things poorly as you are fractionally attending to each thing individually. That's that's my sort of lived experience. Anybody, what, what do you think? You run into that, coaches? So if you've mm. lived that, what have you learned from Nothing, it? Nothing, seemingly. I face it every <laughs> single time. And I've been hosting an ADHD <laughs> podcast about this kind of stuff for 12 years. And I still fight that instinct. So really, I just want to yeah. say out loud, like, it is not something that I feel like I have mastered, even though I know the things. I know to make notes about where I am in the process. I know all the things. My gut is always yelling at me, don't stop till you're finished because you know you're a mess and, and are going to have trouble getting it back, getting into the same flow. And I think that's a, that's a risky piece for me. I deal with it all the time. So you're telling us you haven't mastered your ADHD? <sighs> My name is Pete Wright, <laughs> and I have ADHD. That's right. This is an intervention. Right. I'm at a meeting. Right. <laughs> you know, to that point, though, Pete, one of the things that we learned last week about transitions is that they're always going to happen, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to go away. Unavoidable. And you're ADHD. They're unavoidable. And I think that the one common thing that we need to deal with those transitions is time. We need to have some time to transition. And so I would say that to your experience, which I'm sure a lot of people experience the same thing, is that uh, the awareness piece is a yeah. wonderful thing that you have, oh, yeah. right? Because you know, going into it, that this is what you're thinking. And you're also falling into the all or nothing yes. mindset yeah. and limiting beliefs. Oh, yeah. That you're not ever going to go back, self -talk. right? So there's a lot mm -hmm. of things to unpack there mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think that you can start something, stop. And I think you can also go back and, and finish I, it. I really so, do think that. Uh, right. I'll say this for, for my ADHDers out there. I think I can, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And you will. <laughs> Just keep believing, my friend. Keep believing. Now, this is where we cue yeah. the journey song. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I I think this also takes us into overwhelm, right? Because this is yeah. this is our oh, big sure. our big segue, uh, because yes. it is this feeling of like now I now I suddenly have two overlapping things, and then I'll inevitably end up with more. Um, yes. So, uh, yes. Nikki, set us up. Where do you so, want to start here? Yes, let's talk about overwhelm. Uh, so we're a little behind in the uh, marketing. I didn't plan this very well. Next year, we'll plan it better, Ian, I promise. Uh, but Ian and I are hosting a coaching group around overwhelm with ADHD. And so we thought, you know, it'd be a great way to uh, start talking about it on the show. And then Ian and I will be really prepared when we start doing that coaching group, right? So there's there's a couple of reasons this we want to homework. do this. But yeah, this is homework. Uh, but obviously overwhelm is a, is a word that comes often with clients that come to us to coaching, right? They um, Sometimes they don't know specifically what, what they want to work on. They just know that everything is overwhelming. And uh, from your perspective, Ian, I'm just really curious to know, like when you're working with clients, especially when you start working with clients, how do you break down that overwhelm with them? How, how do you unpack that? Yeah, great question. And you took the, so many times you guys have been talking, take the words right out of my brain. Um, but the, um, yeah, such a high percentage <laughs> excuse me, of people come with that feeling of overwhelm, right? And it is it is massively impactful. And, and they come and they say, oh, I have overwhelm. Like I'm overwhelmed. I have all these things to do. Like I have a million things. I have too many things to do for the time I have available or the energy I have available, right? Um, and but I also hear people come and they have one task, right? They have one task and it's overwhelming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? 
or there's noise and they're feeling overwhelmed, right? Or there's a family event and they feel that's That is a, I, I want to just amplify what you just said because I think it's incredibly important that it doesn't have to be the number of tasks that creates the, the, the feeling of overwhelm. It doesn't have to be overlapping tasks like we've been talking about. It could be the environment mm-hmm. that is making that one task feel completely overwhelming. Absolutely. And to that point, we think that it's an action that we need to do to fix overwhelm. It is a feeling, right? It is not a amalgamation of tasks that have to be done that can just be done and the overwhelm goes away. It's a feeling, right? And that feeling is, is real, um, to quote Frozen. Sorry, I have kids. And we need to respect those feelings of overwhelm, that feeling of I don't have enough energy to do this or this is too much or there's something stopping me. That is a great notification from our bodies, from ourselves, that something's not aligned, um, that it's causing these feelings. So, you know, like Pete said, it's not the number of things necessarily that you need to do. It is the context of the situation that's creating these feeling of overwhelm, right? And um, so I look point. at this, I look at this thing as a boulder, right? I mentioned this to Nikki before that this is a massive boulder of overwhelm, and it stops us in our track. We have something to do. We have a feeling or a place we need to be or a goal we're trying to achieve when we run into this massive boulder, right? And this boulder is an amalgamation of of tasks to do, of uh, pain points, of emotions, right? And we run into this and we feel it and then we avoid. You know, we go left, we go right, we go on to social media, we go on to, you know, we go in to do this thing we need to do for ages and we end up unloading the dishwasher, doing something we hate, but it's better than what we're trying to do, Mm -hmm. right? And this is that feeling of overwhelm, of, of extreme avoidance, of, of not having energy to do what we're doing. Um, so the reason I just wanted to highlight that before we get into overwhelm is because I don't necessarily approach it as, okay, what are we going to do about the task? It's what are the pebbles that come together to create this big boulder? What are the things about what you're trying to achieve um, that are causing this feeling of overwhelm, right? Because we can't do anything about that big boulder. But when we get down to the little pebbles, the little tasks, the things about those tasks, you know, we have to email someone that we're nervous about the feedback or we're late on something or uh, we don't have clarity about what we need to do. Right. Or, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's related to to, to family things or to, to speaking to someone on the phone. These are the pebbles that are attached to these tasks that come together to create that feeling of overwhelm. Mm-hmm. Right? So. Um, so your question was originally, uh, what do I, how do I help people with overwhelm? You know, how do I bring them back from overwhelm? Is, is we have to discover, we have to be curious about what those pebbles are. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and then we need to create clarity, right? So we get some, we get curious about it and then we create some clarity about them, about what it is we actually need to achieve. And then we create some intentional actions, right? That we're leading towards some meaningful impact so before the intentional actions, you're looking at what's causing the feelings of overwhelm. So for example, give us an example of like a situation where someone might be overwhelmed. The holidays are coming up, mm-hmm. right? So what if, the, you know, you have a client who is overwhelmed around these social gatherings so would you ask like, okay, and dig a little bit deeper around what the emotions are? Absolutely. Um, that those first steps of curiosity and clarity are really the first things that go when we don't have excess energy mm-hmm. right? we don't have, you know, we're feeling overwhelmed. We're not like, Oh, let's sit down and think about this. Right. How does this make me feel? You know, what is it? Is it, you know, my mom, my mom always judging me. Right. Or is it that my aunt is coming and, you know, she's always making comments about my pasta. You know, it could be simple things yeah, like this. Yeah. That make us avoid these situations or it gets so noisy in my house at, at holidays that I can't be there and I can't communicate because I'm I'm overwhelmed by the stimulation. Mm-hmm. Right. And and that feeling of overwhelm, yes, it is making us difficult to prepare for the holidays and we feel like it's taking us away from what we need to do. But first we need to, to understand what it is that's activating this overwhelm. What are these pebbles that that are stopping us from starting these tasks? Um, Curiosity and clarity. I like that because it really does, 
it puts a name to it too, right? Because it's kind of like with, with anxiety, sometimes I'll feel anxious, but I don't really know why, like, I don't know what the cause of it is. But then when I sit and I kind of really dig in and think about, okay, what, what could it be? It puts a name to it. So then it feels like I can actually do something about it. It's not so vague. It's, it's like, okay, I get it. I see where it's coming from. Uh, cause even when you said my mother is going to be judging me like that, I was, Oh, whoa, that's, that could be real. Like that could be something there, right. Of feeling like someone is judging the way you host the holidays or what you do with your children or whatever. So that's interesting. So curiosity and clarity, two really important things. You know, there, there's an interesting connection. I had the opportunity to interview a, a Buddhist teacher who, you know, was just very, very wise and, and was introducing us to the concept of Vipassana, right, as a as a uh, meditative, you know, practice for insight. And one of the things that uh, that they were teaching was around specifically around this nature of curiosity. Like you have, uh, the, the example was, oh, you have a, uh, your nose is itching. What happens if you don't reach up and scratch it? Like, what happens if you don't take the the scratch method and instead just ask yourself with all intention, hmm, look at that, that my nose is itching. I wonder what that's about. I wonder why it's itching. And it does not take very long for the itch to go away. That's the thing that's sort of magical about it. Like this curiosity reduces the impact of discomfort in this particular teacher. I've never made this connection with uh, ADHD overwhelm, but I can absolutely see how approaching the pain parts of overwhelm with curiosity might reduce the emotional weight of those feelings. Yeah, it's interesting. But now my nose itches. So it did the <laughs> You did it wrong. No, we totally did it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Supplementing that curiosity is, is kind of what we do, and and then you can do with with someone else as well. But um, now that we have a little bit of clarity, okay. So now that we have seen where the feelings come from, what is it that is on your to do list? Like, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And really making clarity of that. And you know, what are the first steps? Okay, so I'm going to do this, but then oh, I see where that pebble comes up. I see when I'm doing this process, when I show up, it's going to be after the first day, I'm going to get this feedback from this person, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the point where, you know, the pain happens or whatever it is, right? The frustration happens. Okay. So what, what do you think we can do to, to, you know, to, to support that space or to feel less anxious about that or reframe what they're saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that case, we can really prepare ourselves for these experiences um, so that they're not consuming us, you know, for the whole time so we can actually be present and enjoy what we're trying to do and and uh, and not be overwhelmed yeah yeah i i want to lean in a little bit on the on the extreme end of overwhelm like approaching overwhelm from a coaching context and from an emotional context when you've already reached the point of you know avoidance and shutdown right where you are emotionally suddenly ill-equipped to break the pattern that you have gotten yourself into around feeling overwhelmed. What's your, what, what's your method for approaching that for folks? Yeah. Um, usually a way that fits a bit of, or hits a bit of resistance, um, actually is to mm -hmm. breathe. Right? Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, if your nervous system is so tight and you're so, you know, and, and you've had such an experience where you don't have any capacity left to be curious or to create clarity about what you're trying to achieve or, or create an action. All we can do is step back and take a breath, right? And, and you know, I really work with clients and I've seen huge impacts of building in little micro uh, breathing exercises throughout their day mm -hmm. and not just responsive, but okay, you start your day, you know, we, you know, we find a, a breathing app that works for them, for example, and it, they just practice a bit of breathing and then, you know, oh, they're going to go into work and they get overwhelmed at work. Okay, so before we go into the office, let's do a little breathing, right? And then at lunch, let's stop and take a few breaths and we'll just give our nervous system a chance to reset, right? Because life doesn't stop, right? The demands don't stop, work doesn't stop, family doesn't stop, right? But we need to make intentional actions here to help calm our nervous system down, mm -hmm. you know? And then when we have a little bit of space 
it enabled some room for that curiosity for building in that clarity. Um, so that, that tends to work pretty well mm -hmm. with people. I love that. Well, and I can tell sometimes when I start a session with a client, when we need to just do the breathing first, mm. you know, because you can see that, okay, they're really hyped up around this or whatever it is that they want to talk about and doing that breathing to set the tone of the session can really make a big difference. I'm glad that you bring that up. And so much of what we talked about last week too, Pete, mm -hmm. and the week before with James Ochoa was around that breathing and how important it is to, to help us recenter ourselves when we start to feel overwhelmed. Well, yeah. And again, it's not, I mean, the, I like the way you present it, Ian, it's a, that your nervous system is wound up. Like breathing is not just mm -hmm. a, you know, it's not a woo-woo thing, right? It's a, it's a thing that physiologically is going to help you uh, approach the world mm -hmm. in a different way. Because again, you're going to break the pattern of, of tightening that you, that you've gotten yourself into, uh, mm -hmm. which is only too natural, I think, for us. And that was something I was thinking about both of you as coaches, like the idea that you're, that somebody is coming to you and is totally relaxed and absolutely chill about what's on their plate is it probably probably a little rare <laughs> not real likely yeah. uh, no 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 it's about transitions yeah. right. right to bring right people in transitions and transitions create overwhelm because it changes the demand on your executive yeah. functions right the yeah. way in which you're functioning and those can be a new job a new child mm -hmm. a family event or they can just be switching from an email to a phone call, right? Or speaking to someone you like speaking to, to someone you don't like, or, you know, these are all transitions, mm -hmm. right? right? They're all shift attention and, and purpose of, of your executive functions. So I want to go back to the person who has shut down, because I see that a lot with people. And it most likely has something to do with shame, around whatever it is that they need to follow up on, right? So this is, let's say, that email that needs to be sent or uh, if you work on your own and the invoice that needs to be sent but is late, now you don't really know if you should send the invoice because now you feel like you aren't worthy of that invoice, whatever might happen, right? So when that happens, Ian, what are some things that you do to help clients work through that when you know there is something specific that they're avoiding. Sure. Sure. And that's, that's where I try to supplement their curiosity, mm -hmm. right? That's where we do a little bit of digging a little bit of, okay, so what is it about that email? Like, is it the beginning of the email, the end of the email, you know, and then we, you know, we move towards things like, okay, what's the next step we can take? Right. Mm -hmm. So what is the really specific next step? Oh, they say send the email. Well, yeah, that is a step. But what is the next step? The next step is, is being comfortable with what's written. Right? Okay. Because um, I feel like a perfectionist. Like I, I have to get it right. I look at it 10,000 times and it takes me a whole day and then I don't even send it. Right. Okay. So you're not going to, you haven't sent the email. So what, what, what little bit of control, I think, is another interesting conversation to have about this overwhelm space. But I'm going to. Take that thought, note it, put it on the side for a second. Okay. Uh, what is it, you know, can we control in this situation, right? You have an issue or you have a challenge sending this email. Do you have any resources of anyone that you can send a draft to, right? How can we reframe the purpose of this email and write it as a draft? So I had this thought, what do you think? And send it in that kind of email. Or do you have a colleague they say, what do you think about this email? You know, or, you know, something something that really takes a small step that we can control to start making progress on this mm -hmm. you know it's not about sending that email it's about getting a bit of momentum mm -hmm. and a little bit more confidence in your capacity and and ideally uh the next step would be a bit of a framework okay because you have to send more than email one email right, right. it's not that you send this one email you never have to send one again right so when these emails come up what are we going to do right how are we going to approach them because that anxiety is going to kick in until we feel more confident in them, right? So we need to build a relationship with someone that we can bounce back and forth emails with or a different framework in which we write them in or, you know, mm -hmm. or find a template to follow, mm -hmm. right? So we need to get a bit of control so you don't feel that 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 overwhelm as much. You have something to do. You have a, a, a movement to make. 
I like how you're talking about kind of building that confidence, you know, because I think especially as coaches, when we're talking to our clients and we're asking those questions, a lot of times I see the client with that kind of aha moment of, wait a minute, okay, maybe it's not as bad as I think it's going to be. Maybe I am, you know, thinking that I'm going to get fired, but that's not really going to be what happens, you know, because I think they're, you know, a lot of ADHDers are verbal processors. So when they're talking it through with someone else and being able to just talk it out and not just think about it, uh, Mm -hmm. they do come to their own kind of realizations of, okay, this is, this is where I can have some control and feel a little bit more confident about it. The control part. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, the control one is an interesting one. In it. And more interesting is the lack of the feeling of a lack of control. Mm. Right. And and I think it, it can go hand in hand with the overwhelm. Right. I have too much to do. I have too many things. Like I can't, I can't control what this person is going to say to me or this thing is going to happen. Right. And so I don't know the next step. I don't know the right thing to do. Right. And we learn, we lose control. And, um, you know, it goes hand in hand with the concept of, of learned helplessness, mm. right? where we try things and we fail or we, we just don't feel like we have any control over the situation. So we stop trying. Mm-hmm. Right. And then that's going to really activate avoidance. Mm-hmm. Right? When we don't feel like anything we're going to do is going to make this better. Yeah. Right? And we don't know what the next step is going to be. And so, you know, like, but I know I have to do it. Right. right. Things are still there. The pressure is still there. It doesn't disappear. But it's this really conflict between I'm not like, there's nothing I can do and I have to do it. Right. You go back and forth, back and forth. And then you just, you mm-hmm. know, you, you find your avoidance outlet to, to do that. Right? right. So, so finding that clarity, finding that next step, finding something that, that you can control in the situation mm-hmm. picks a different relationship. Right. It, it is. And recognizing that action can give you that little bit of, oh, look, I did this. Right. Uh, sure. Like, oh, look at that. Okay, I can do this. Then then what's the next step? Okay, mm-hmm. I can do this. The big scary thing still might be there, but we're getting closer, mm-hmm. right? And as we get closer to that boulder, it gets smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. We've seen those optical illusions, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's the thing and then you get close to it. Or is it the other way? It looks small. Oh, that's a bad example. Um, it works. <laughs> So the bigger, the closer you get to it, the you know you realize it's just like a coat hanging in the closet, right. it's not a monster, right? Right. We can do something about this. Yeah. So when we're far away, it looks like a big scary thing. It looks like a big scary thing. Yeah. Can you guys reflect for me just briefly on managing overwhelm of interpersonal relationships, um, and uh, specifically, uh, it it can be challenging, I think, and I uh, with ADHD to. Um, to feel like you're able to manage uh, a a group of close friendships, right? That maintaining the communication, the you know, the activity, the relationship in itself is is become overwhelming or becomes an overwhelming set of of tasks. And yet, we also know that having relationships is key to emotional psychological health. How do you balance those things when someone comes in and says, I just don't have room for more than, you know, one or two close friends in, in spite of people wanting to be my friend? I don't have room. I have to I have to shut them out and risk hurting people. It is an interesting one. And I, you know, my bridge goes back to curiosity, mm-hmm. you know, um, where, you know, what is it that that you want? Like, what does the individual want? Right. Um, what is what of this feeling is people pleasing? Mm-hmm. Right. What is the feeling that I'm only valuable if I meet everyone else's needs? You know, what are these? What is it from other people's pressure that's not even pressure, but their interest mm-hmm. even in you is is activating this versus what kind of relationships do you want? Where do you get value from the relationships? And and how do you create clarity on what you want to be bringing to these relationships? Right. And and being able to map this out so that um it's not again a big boulder of you know they have this and i have this and that and that right how do we how do we kind of suss this out a little bit so that we can we can be making uh kind of educating actions mm-hmm. intentional act mm-hmm. about uh about these mm-hmm. relationships 
mm-hmm. you know, and not just reactive. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I definitely think I agree with, uh, you know, finding out like, where's the people pleasing coming? Like, do you feel obligated, you know, or, and also where, where do you have space and time for these kinds of relationships? And I think, you know, we were talking about this in uh, our GPS group um, about me being an introvert. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, and the conversation came up where we had a neighborhood gathering out in our cul-de-sac. And, um, Pete, you know, my husband very well. He loves those things. He loves, he'll go and talk to anybody anytime, forever along they want to talk. Uh, But this happened to be on a Sunday afternoon and I was not in that space and I did not have the energy to talk to them. And I really wanted to just stay home and do what I was doing. And um, for me, it was okay to, to save that. Like I, I felt like I was doing something that was good for me, even if it was at the expense of maybe connecting with these neighbors. Right. Right. So I think, um, when it comes to relationships, friendships, especially are a two way street, you know, the communication needs to go both ways. And if you feel like you're always reaching out and no one, you know, that person isn't, reaching back out, then maybe it isn't the right friendship. Um, But I also think that we have some responsibility too to connect with others that we want to connect with. But I, but I also think it's okay to keep your circle small if that's, if that's what you need. And for me being an introvert, my circle is pretty small. Um, And I can be extroverted when I need to be. Um, But, uh, but I also know what I'm capable of. It kind of goes back to that spoons thing that we talked about a long time ago, Pete, like how many spoons do you have to give to people? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You know, I get five a day. Black market spoon trade is just blown up. Yeah. Yeah. And Sunday afternoons, yeah, I'm going to protect that time, you know? Um, So I don't know if that helps answer your question. I I think it's interesting. And I think because there is so much, um, there's so much kind of natural instinct toward black and white thinking with ADHD, like coming around and stopping right. and saying, look, I've, I got room for three people in my life. And when a new person comes in that that's, you know, fantastic, new, shiny, uh, then some, something's going to give and I'm going to shut down an old relationship because I just don't have space. And that's, that is probably going to be an implied shutdown. Like I'll just stop returning calls because of my attention is now elsewhere. And that can be, um, you know, that can be a, a painful sort of kind of overwhelm, I think, to to experience, which is, you know, I'm, I'm letting people down, but I'm letting people down so far in the back of my mind because my attention is is here. And, um, you know, that's, I, that's well, and friendships especially can be really seasonal, yeah. too. I mean, I think depending on Truly. what season you are in your life. Right. Like, yeah. I know that I've had really good friends at in a work situation. But as soon as like I either left that workplace or they oh, left yeah. that workplace, that friendship didn't really last, yeah. you know. Um, so I think it does kind of depend, too, on what kind of season you're in. Right. right. Mm-hmm. The interesting point about time. Right. And. ADHD and time and now and not yeah. now, yeah. right? Thinking, uh, ah, like to be valuable in this relationship, I have to be engaged all the time, right? And now is important. And then the next now is important as well. When in fact, there is time and people understand. Yes. And, you know, they understand your barriers, right? And, and I think it's when we can become more clear on these and, and a little and more confident in them or, or have an intentional action around them, people respond a lot better. Oh, you know, I, I've hit my maximum today, guys. Sorry, I have to go. Like, it's too much. Or, you know, uh, saying, okay, Google guys, I'm going to come for three hours. You know, but having these clarity and putting things in place yeah, really enable it to maintain these. Because otherwise, you know, you, you just disappear, you ghost, you shut down, and, and then people start interpreting things differently. And then it really we think people are interpreting things differently, right? And start that ruminating, oh, I should have said this, and I, right? But setting these boundaries beforehand, creating clarity for yourself and thinking about this um, can really enable them to have more healthy interactions, even if it is only for part of the time, mm-hmm. right? Only if you only have to go to the barbecue and say, hey guys, 
Uh, lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, my husband's here and the friends are here. I'm going to have to go now, but, but please enjoy, you know, whatever, yeah. right? If that's something yeah. you're up for. Yeah. That is a boundary setting. That is an action that, that supports you with the relationship, but also respects your need for, for, um, for peace. Mm -hmm. Well, and that also that. lands hard in the spirit of, you know, always leave them wanting more, right? Like this is, we learned this from <laughs> PT Barnum, right? Set the timer for two hours on a five hour party and get out of there because they'll want you back next time. That's uh, right. You're taking That's care right. of yourself and your own showmanship. It's outstanding. Uh -huh. That is great. <laughs> uh, well, this was great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ian, for being here. Yeah. Mm, it was my pleasure. Really, honestly, great subject. And I'm really looking forward to our group sessions. Yes. Looking forward to working with people. And, and I love I love group sessions because sure we have a lot to bring, but just the value that comes from all the individuals that show up and share and are vulnerable and um, it's just it's like it's this weird magic that happens mm -hmm. in group session. Absolutely. Really, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, and we'll do more. Yeah. So even uh, though this one is closed, it, we will do more. So we didn't actually say that, that up front. List. It, this one is already closed. So we're, it we're is real, closed. real sorry yeah. that we're introducing Ian to you now. I and know. Not the before. timing was terrible. I know. It was just, <laughs> it was just uh, we, we, we kind of screwed up our recording schedule. But we're really excited uh, that Ian is here and with us. Don't even need to ask him for a plug. He already did a great plug. So, uh, hey, we're just right. thrilled uh, that he's here. Well, and if so. you're interested in coaching with Ian. He is on the website yep. too. He's taking individual clients. That's right. That's right. That's right. Very, very exciting. Thank you guys. Way to leave him wanting more, Pete. I think you really employed that quite well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for downloading and listening to this show. We sure appreciate your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute about this conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel and Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level. On behalf of Ian Waller and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Thank you.